And now, gracious God, having worshipped you through music and scripture, singing and fellowship, speak to us now. Also, we pray through the sharing of your word. That not only the words of my mouth, but more importantly, the meditations of all of our hearts would be found acceptable in your sight, O God, because we acknowledge you as our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Each year there are myriad best dressed lists that appear in various publications. It seems like every time there's a major event such as People's Choice Awards, Golden Globe, the Oscars, the Academy Awards, that magazine editors, fashion consultants, other people will get together and comprise a best dressed list. Well, not all that long ago, there was the Golden Globe Awards. And for some strange reason, it seems sometimes that we are more interested in what people wear to the awards than the awards that they actually get. So after the, uh, all the hoopla and fanfare and awards have been presented, the next day or so, People's Magazine published their list of the best dressed. Best Dressed Females, according to the editorial board of People's Magazine for this year's Golden Globe, included Kristen Bell, Amy Adams, Jenna Rodriguez, Evan Rachel Wood, Lily Collins, Emma Stone, Andy Moore, Natalie Portman. Not to be outdone, there are also gentlemen who show up in very sharp-looking sartorial attire and so there is a best dressed gentleman's list according to GQ gentlemen's quarterly the best dressed men who showed up this year at Golden Globes included Orlando Bloom, Ryan Gosling, Jason Statham and a Scottish actor's name who I will probably mispronounce Sam Hugan who plays on Outlander and my wife thinks is a good looking guy, but that's kind of beside the point, but he made, made the list. And I promise that in a few weeks, just as soon as the Academy Awards are over and the Oscars, those little golden statues have been given out, there will be more and more lists. We do seem as a people, do we not to have a lot of interest in clothes and clothing? Have you ever stopped to calculate all the time we spend shopping for clothes, selecting clothes, and all the money we spend purchasing clothes. Clothing industry is alive and well. But it's just not what celebrities wear at events. It's, uh, it's what we wear, too. Indeed, I would propose that one of the basic questions in life for a lot of us is, what are you going to wear? So what, what are you going to wear? To work tomorrow? To school on campus? To church? What are you going to wear to the ball game? Well, I shouldn't have used that example. What are you going to wear to the ball game, to the, to the banquet, to the concert, to the party, to the dance, to the formal, to the prom? What are you, you going to wear? And then closer related to this question of what are you going to wear is a question of, what type of clothing should we wear? What is appropriate and not appropriate for us to wear? Because now, when you go to an event, you need to find out ahead of time, is it business attire, business casual attire, or just casual attire? Is it formal or semi-formal? Or is it come as you please? All kinds of what can be perceived as appropriate clothing to particular events. 
well, there are gym clothes and workout clothes and clothes for sleeping and clothes for lounging around the house and clothes for tennis and clothes for golf and clothes to wear to the pool and clothes to wear to the picnic and clothes to wear skiing and clothes to wear when we go on a hike. Uh, there's clothes to wear when it's hot and clothes to wear when it's cold and we don't know what in the world to wear when it's somewhere in between. You know, there's quite a few people who are especially gifted at coordinating the wearing of clothes, of what goes with what to create a very sharp looking appropriate outfit. I'm not horrible at clothes coordination, but I, I'm, not, I'm not the greatest. So I actually have to rely on my fashion coordinator, who's my wife. She's not here this morning. She is at her yearly reading recovery conference in Columbus, Ohio. So I hope this is okay. I, I think I'm safe. She's, she's, told me, she's told me that before. But, you know, there are all kinds of times, Hank, that I'll, and Hank's got a really sharp tie on. I've already told him that this morning. He's looking good. Did you pick that out or what? You did. Okay, well, that's great. But I need a fashion coordinator, so I, I needed to, you know, I needed to ask Deborah. And time upon time, I'll ask her questions like, does this shirt go with this sport coat? Does this tie go with this suit? And inevitably, I will ask her, can you tell if this is black or navy blue? I mean, that drives me crazy, especially with socks. But lo and behold, last year at a clothing outlet, I found a store devoted exclusively to socks, quality socks, brand name socks. And the black socks were black and the blue socks were blue, navy. And the blue socks had this little blue stripe across the toe and Deborah was thrilled and so was I. Is it okay if I wear this? Well, you can, she'll say sometimes, but I wouldn't be caught dead. Okay, so, you know, so sometimes we need a little bit of help when it comes to coordinating our clothes. And then there, there are the responses. Do you remember when you were teenagers or maybe if you're a teenager out there now, maybe this still happens to you? And you're in your early teens or your mid-teens and you're getting ready to go out to an event, a ball game, a dance, or on a date or something. And you walk down the stairs and you try to slip out the door and your parents, your, your mom usually, or maybe your dad, what in the world are you wearing? You've got to be kidding. That's not decent to wear to the event you're going to. Get back up there and change your clothes. Yeah. Fashion police are everywhere, you know, even in our homes. But, but speaking of changing clothes, have you noticed? Most of us spend more time and more energy then we might imagine in this endeavor, we change our closets on a seasonal basis, summer wardrobe, winter wardrobe. I told the college students while ago, I've just got a all encompassing seasonal 10 year old wardrobe. There's everything, you know, in my closet. But there are many, many days, probably when you change clothes several times. In fact, I would venture to say that some of you changed clothes several times before you got out the door this morning because you could not decide if this outfit looked right for today. I don't need any hands, but that's probably happened. Well, especially on those Sunday mornings when I preach three straight services like I've done this morning, I change clothes a lot because our 8.30 service is a more contemporary casual service. And most of the time I wear a, a nice pair of slacks and if it's a summertime, a polo shirt or a golf shirt, or like this morning, I had on a, a button down white shirt and a sweater. And then as soon as that service is over during the Sunday school hour, one of the first things I do after I get another cup of coffee is to rush to my office and to change into my 11 o'clock formal go to sanctuary worship clothes. And I put on a suit and white shirt and tie. The only problem is on those occasions when I have to preach the college service first at 1045 and get back over here very quickly, the college service you see is, um, is pretty casual too. But I'm already dressed up for 11 o'clock worship because there's not time in between to change. 
And so I go over to the summit service at 1045 and I take off my sport coat and I roll up my sleeves and I loosen my tie and I try to look like I'm casual, which I'm not at all. And then as soon as that's over, and this happened about five minutes ago, I will pray as I'm going out the door with the benediction and with the help of some people back there, I'll put back on this coat. I will, you know, button up my shirt. I'll tighten up my tie and I'll run over here. I barely made it this morning and Hank's always got a story or two that he can fill in with in case I don't make it, but I'm kind of on the run. And so if I come over here at 11 o'clock, especially on those days when my fashion coordinator is not here in someplace else and I look a little bit disheveled and my tie's a little crooked, or if my tie is showing at the collar in the back, just let me know about it and forgive me and, and give, me, uh, give me a break. Would you do that? Clothes. Well, Bob, that's a, that's a good fashion editorial. Why are you bringing that up in church? Throughout the Bible, the biblical writers were inspired by God to use the symbolism and the imagery of clothing to remind God's people how they should live, how they should behave. It's kind of permeated throughout Holy Scripture. We overlook it from time to time. In Isaiah 29, uh, Isaiah 11, 5, a Messianic passage Righteousness shall be the undergirding of his waist, the Messiah faithfulness, the belt of his loins. Job 29, 14, Job declares, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe. Now the Apostle Paul, the writer of our text for this morning, was especially fond of using this image of clothing and this metaphor notice it there it's it's for you in narrative in your bulletin program and this narrative of putting off and putting on reminding those people at Colossae they were already Christians that if they were really in Christ they had become new creatures and old things had passed away and new things had come and as a symbolic way of representing that Paul said now remember you've already put off old pieces of clothing and he'll list them there for you anger malice lying but in our emphasis for today in verse 12 and following he said but now as a new creature in christ you are to behave like followers of jesus christ so be sure that you change your wardrobe appropriately and put on compassion and kindness and humility and in meekness, which in the Bible is not weakness, but inner strength, and put on patience. And wrap that whole wardrobe up in a bow of love. So what are you wearing this morning, Christians? Anything from the old nature which still vies for our attention that you might need to put off something from Paul's list of a foundational appropriate Christian wardrobe that with God's help and the encouragement of people even in the church you might need to start putting on Dalen a professor of New Testament probably knows that in the early church, Dalen, I hope I'm getting this right, that clothes played a, a very important role in baptism. To the extent that, that often someone who had just accepted Christ as Lord and Savior and was a candidate for baptism would come and take off or put off or get rid of their old clothes. And as they came up out of the waters of, of baptism, they would come up with a, a new white robe, putting off the old nature, putting on the new nature, signifying that a wonderful change had occurred in their life. Now, here's the deal. 
just because you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that doesn't always mean that your conduct, your behavior, what you metaphorically wear is always going to be appropriate. All those old pieces of clothing still sneak back into our wardrobe. In fact, some people never throw anything out of their wardrobe. Have, have you noticed that? Mine's like that too sometimes if you don't ever change from summer to winter and, and the closet light goes out and you're in a hurry and you go in there and you get something, and, ah, I mean, it's not appropriate anymore. So this process of putting on a new nature in Christ, it's, it's an ongoing process. It's never going to end this side of heaven. There's, there's always improvement to make, but Paul is saying to those Christians at Colossae, he's saying to us as Christ followers today, be sure that you have some basic pieces of spiritual clothing in your wardrobe. Now, I've already told you that I'm not the greatest when it comes to fashion, though I, I like to dress well, and I'm glad God gave me Debbie to, to help out. But I am aware that if you are going as a man to have a good, solid, basic wardrobe, there are certain foundational pieces of clothing that you need to have. You probably need to have a really nice looking, sharp, navy blue sport coat. You need to have some really nice gray dress slacks or perhaps khaki colored dress slacks. You need to have probably both a white and a blue dress shirt. And in case the event is not open collar, you need a couple of ties that coordinate with those outfits, depending upon if you're wearing gray or khaki slacks. You, you need to have a basic leather, black or brown belt. You need to have some very nice, probably black, perhaps brown or cordovan. And you need to have some socks. But now you know have to worry if they're black or blue because if you go to where I get my socks remember they got that little stripe on top of them but anyway there's foundational pieces of clothing that you ought to have now there are other accessories and items of clothing that you could add I'm not going to begin to tell you what the basics are in a ladies wardrobe I'll, I'll leave that to you ladies and my fashion corner and it gets back I, I do think that in most of those wardrobes there would be a, a really nice basic black dress and, and I'm okay with that I think and Probably some really nice black slacks and some really nice shoes, uh, really nice blouse. That, that's all I know. You all can fill in the details. Here's the deal. If you want to be the best follower of the Lord Jesus Christ that you can possibly be, there need to be some basic metaphorical pieces of clothing in your Christian wardrobe. Paul talks about five foundational pieces in chapter 3, verse 12. After he's already told us to put off the old clothes, representing our old way of life without Christ, he said, now, remember, Christians, you who have been baptized already, that you've put on Christ. You're supposed to wrap the whole thing in love, and so your wardrobe ought to include five basics. They're right there for you. Colossians 3.12, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, which means inner strength, and patience. What are you wearing this morning? Have you got the basic foundational pieces in your wardrobe? Any old clothing that you need to get rid of and cast aside. Today and over the next several weeks, I'm going to propose that we journey together through Colossians 3.12. We'll call it the Christian's wardrobe, and we'll take one of those basic foundational pieces each week. For just a few moments this morning, the first one is compassion. Compassion is much more than just feeling sorry for someone else. It's not just sympathy. One definition of compassion that I especially like goes something like this. It's the capacity to recognize the suffering of others and then taking action to help alleviate that suffering. 
It's not just recognizing that people are hurting and unfortunate. It's with God's help taking some steps. Not that you can alleviate all suffering, but taking some steps, some positive steps to help alleviate that suffering too. There are two basic components to this compassion clothing that we're talking about. It's recognition that there's a lot of hurt in our world. You probably passed a lot of it, even on the way to church this morning. If you didn't, you'll pass it today as you go out to eat. There are a lot of people who are hurting right here. So part of compassion is just having your eyes open, not just your physical eyes, but your spiritual eyes, and then, oh, hey, there's some folks here that are hurting. But then it's the second key component, which is, and with God's help, perhaps with the help of the church and organizations and programs that the church has, you'll take some action. You'll get involved trying to help alleviate that suffering. That's kind of a definition. Recognition and taking some action. The illustration, the best illustration of compassion is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Read the Gospels as they tell about his ministry, and they will have some summary statements which sound a little bit like this statement. And Jesus looked out at the crowds, and he had compassion on them because they were hurting and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he didn't just look to see that there were needs and a lot of misfortune. He became the active great shepherd. Do you remember? Who even gave his life for the sheep. So this compassionate Christ calls upon we who are his followers to don the compassionate clothing too. And so just so we won't forget that, he told what perhaps along with the parable of the prodigal son is one of his two greatest and most memorable parables of all. It was the parable you know as the Good Samaritan and you know the story, but if you pay attention to the story there in Luke chapter 10, clothing plays an issue in the story. Because this gentleman's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, it literally goes down. It's a 17 mile journey. It's a dangerous journey. He probably didn't need to be traveling alone because the road cut through Mountains, there were high ravines on each side. There were boulders where people could hide. There were lots of robbers, and he got robbed. He got beat up. Took all his stuff. They stripped him of his clothing, it says. And clothing was one of the key identification factors for people of that day and age. You see, with, with that clothing, People couldn't tell, is, is this guy, is he a Samaritan? What's he doing here in our borders? Is he a Jew? Is he from someplace else? Skin tone was pretty much the same, but clothing was identification tag. Here's somebody in the ditch. Should we, should we help this kind of person? Is this our neighbor we're supposed to have compassion for? And you know the story as well as I do of First people that come along are a priest and a Levite. They're the religious leaders. This part of the story, Hank, always makes you and me look kind of bad. I'm, you know, I'm hoping we could do a little bit better. But, guys, because here's the deal. They're probably in a hurry getting to church to do the service. Because if the service is supposed to start at 11 o'clock and you're on live radio and you don't show up to about 11, well, you understand. They, they had stuff to do. But here's the other thing that you may not realize. In that day and age, for anyone, especially a priest or a Levite, to touch a corpse made them religiously impure. Then they would become ostracized for a while and outcast, and they couldn't go to church and help other people through their job. This guy looked like he's not only half dead, maybe he was dead, 
hey, let's let somebody else fool with this corpse. We've got to go lead the church. So don't be too hard on these guys. We would probably be like that too. And so the person that comes along, and by this time the guy in the ditch is moaning a little bit and thinking that the, that the priest and the Levites, they didn't stop. I, I'm probably out of it. And the next person that comes is a Samaritan. His clothing identifies him as a Samaritan. He doesn't really know at first. Is this guy that needs help? A Jew, a Samaritan, a refugee from someplace else. He recognized him as the priest and Levite had recognized him, but he took seriously the second component of compassion and he took some action to help alleviate the suffering of the man in the ditch. Isn't it interesting that in this parable, two people who normally wouldn't associate with each other, because the guy in the ditch was probably a, a Jewish person, that they end up having an interaction. See, Jews and Samaritans literally hated each other. Jews regarded themselves as a pure race, God's chosen people. The Samaritans, eh, not so much. Long ago, people from the Assyrian and Babylonian Empire had whisked in people from that empire. They had intermarried with the Jews. They were half-breeds. They weren't pure. And besides, the Samaritans didn't worship at the right place. They worshiped at Mount Gerizim up in the north. When everybody knows that the right place to worship is 150 East High Street. I mean, Jerusalem, you know, right there, the temple. And their theology was different. You know, the people of, of the Law and the Prophets, they, they followed all the scrolls, all the books of what we now know as the Old Testament. But, no, those Samaritans, they only accepted the first five books. What's wrong with those people? Their theology is all messed up. We can't associate with people like that. They don't live here. What are they doing here? They know they're not supposed to cross the border. What in the world is happening here? And it's the Samaritan who has compassion and takes action and renders help. Ladies and gentlemen, isn't it amazing how a parable that Jesus told centuries ago is still so very relevant in our situation today. Because right before Paul gives that basic pieces of clothing which calls for compassion, he says in the verse before, to the Christians, now remember now that you've been renewed in Christ, that you've put off your old way of thinking and put on a new way of thinking. I want you to remember now, church, there is no longer Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, refugee, slave, free. All people are created in the image of God. All are worthy of your compassion Kind of amazing how the scripture still speaks. Well, I know, I know it this way, it's that way, but could you and I, who are the beneficiaries of God's love, dare to put on just a little bit more compassion? Not that we shouldn't be safe, we should, but even be willing to take a risk or two to get to know folks who are different, whose identity is not like our own, who sometimes need our help and sometimes who can give us help, who are all, biblically speaking, created in the image of God. So many times I see it happening here at Calvary Church. 
people like Ryan and Felisa Chapin, Benita King, Roxy Allison, Brian Varble, and a host of others periodically put on their compassion clothes, make a journey down to Haiti. Well, they're different there. People love God there. They need God there. And our clothed, compassionate Calvary people don't only recognize the need, they, they start to help. Early every morning, Monday through Friday, at the Recreation and Outreach Center of the Rock Fellowship Hall, people like Mike Taylor and Tom Kelly and John Robert put on their compassion clothes. They make it possible, because the church makes it possible, for homeless people to have a hot shower. And every Christmas I see it, most all of you all, in some form or fashion, by the money you give, the prayers that you pray, the deliveries you make, you put on your compassion clothes. We make it possible through the Christmas project, not only for needy families to have Christmas, but for needy families to know that we're praying for them, that they're important to us. We put on compassion clothes. And I could keep going this morning and tell you of people and organizations in this church and outside of this church that call for the members of that organization to put on some compassion to make a difference. And I commend you, Calvary, for being a compassionate church and a compassionate people. But the reminder that Paul made to the Colossians long ago is still a good reminder for us, is it not? To be about this process, and it's a process of trying to conduct ourselves as best we can by putting off, and we have to keep putting off some of this old nature stuff, but putting on this new nature. What's in your closet? What are you wearing? I hope that you will join me in trying to establish a foundational Christian wardrobe of kindness, humility, meekness which is inner strength and patience, and above all this day, compassion. Jesus asked a question about that parable. Who in the parable do you think was a good neighbor? He was probably talking to a Jewish person who couldn't even bring himself to say, a Samaritan. But you know what he said? The one who showed compassion. The one who showed mercy. You know what Jesus said to him? What he says to us? Go and do likewise.